Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was once again directed by Steven Spielberg, produced by George Lucas, and this time around written by David Kep. This was a draft that was going around for a long time. Many different people tried to write the script. Frank Darabont originally wrote a draft even. Spielberg apparently loved it. Lucas didn't. Even M. Night Shyamalan was asked to pen a draft of this script, a proposition that I imagine must have been very attractive for him since he has often said that Raiders of the Lost Ark is one of his favorite films. But eventually everyone agreed on something and in 2008 we got the fourth Indiana Jones movie and I have rarely been as excited as I was for this movie. I was so hyped. Spielberg released this picture when production began and ever since seeing that photo, my mind and body, they were both very ready. There was no reason to think that a fourth Indiana Jones movie wouldn't be good. I loved all three of the others. It's Steven Spielberg and George Lucas collaborating again. In life, you have your doubts with everything, but there was no concrete reason other than it's been a really long time since these people have made one of these to assume that it wouldn't be any good. And I remember seeing the film for the first time and leaving the theater, and I was, I was definitely in denial. I remember just being like, it's like a B. Yeah, it's a, it's like a B. And even though I was in denial about it, I knew right off the bat instantly that it was the worst of the four. But I couldn't bring myself to say that I didn't like it. I was just so crushed by the possibility of this movie that I had been hearing about for so many years. Hell, in the 90s, I remember reading about this in magazines, the ideas they had for like a haunted castle and all these ideas that I couldn't wait to see on the big screen. But then I saw the film one more time in theaters and again on DVD and I thought to myself, mm, it's not like a B. Okay. The film opens with the older version of the Paramount logo, like seen in Raiders, except Golf Western has been replaced with Viacom. I don't know why he thought CGI Gopher was great, but he did. It was like an omen. That was the warning bell, really. The opening shot warned all of us that this is not going anywhere good. Now, what I do want to say is I'm not going to sit here and trash this entire movie just because it's popular to hate on Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. If you guys have watched my channel for a long time, you know that I... I don't like mob mentality. I don't like piling on something just because other people are, whether that's praise or saying something shit. I don't like this movie, but I find it aggressively mediocre. I'm not going to say this is a Dragon Ball Evolution level pile of crap because it's not. There are good ideas throughout this movie and there are some good sequences throughout this movie and I'll talk about those too. The film takes place in 1957 and it utilizes that era fairly well. It's kind of like a B-movie, a science fiction B-movie, where the previous trilogy was more of the 1930s, those old Republic serials. This is a B-movie. The film opens with a disposable but entertaining chase sequence with some college kids listening to Elvis. They encounter the Russians and they have a little race together before the Russians eventually end up at a secret military base. And this is the first time in the movie that I began to notice the lighting and the cinematography. It's extremely harsh and very bright. Everything looks overblown. Compare these two different shots from Raiders and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I don't understand why it looks like that. This happens a lot throughout Crystal Skull. This film looks very clean. I'm going to talk a little bit about their uniforms and how even the uniforms just look freshly laundered throughout the entire movie, even though they're dealing with fire ants and tombs and cobwebs and skeletons. Everybody looks like they just walked out of the laundry room. The other films look dirty and unpolished, rough around the edges. Next, we're reintroduced to Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones all these years later, and for the most part, I think he's great as the character, especially considering his age at the time. He does so many of the stunts himself, and he really sells a lot of this movie. He's one of the main draws of the film, and one of the few things about the movie that you can't really pick apart. He's damn good in the movie. Ray Winstone is also introduced here as Mac, a terrible character. He's motivated entirely by money, so whoever pays him the most, he's going to be on their side, which makes for a character that you just don't understand. You don't know what he wants, how he feels. You know nothing about him, except that if he sees dollar signs, that's the direction he will head. It's just a boring character. If he was just in a few scenes, it'd be one thing, but he's in the whole movie all the way to the end. And the film asks us to really care about him later, and we just don't. Here in the opening, we also meet Spalco, played by Kate Blanchett. She's... <sighs> I'm indifferent. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm just, I'm indifferent to Spalco. I, I, she's not awful. She's not great. 
She serves her purpose as an evil Russian character who has a haircut. <laughs> and again, why does this all look so fake? Even a simple outdoor scene like this just looks so studio lit. So soon Indiana Jones is forced to go inside the warehouse where the Ark of the Covenant was left at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I like that they confirm that this is Area 51. That's a fun idea for an opening, having to explore this place that is filled with so many objects I'm sure Indy would love to get his hands on, but they're looking for something very specific. And Indy knows the contents of the box are highly magnetic, and so they use gunpowder and shotgun shells to find this box. This sequence is fine. It's okay. It's not a terrible opening. It's not like you're watching this scene going, oh boy, this is going to be a shitty movie. It's fine. This is an okay scene. And I like the action in it as well for the most part. Indy swinging on the light and thinking he was just about to make it to the truck before he crashes back into another one is classic Indiana Jones. It's one of the few moments in this movie where he displays some vulnerability, a human side. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's there's not a lot of that in the movie. The idea of Indiana Jones and how he fights bad guys is that he always escapes by the skin of his teeth. He's this close to dying, just like John McClane. It's one of the reasons Die Hard 5 sucks, because he's just guy with gun in Die Hard 5. And Indy's just too powerful in this movie. One of the reasons I believe that that happened is because all of the years that passed between the 80s and the trilogy in 2008, when we finally got four, Indy had basically become immortalized as a pop culture hero at this point. We kind of view him as a god in the film world, and so approaching him again, it feels like they weren't looking at him like he was a human being. It feels like they got caught up in the drama of making another Indiana Jones movie, and they forgot to make him a person in this one. And although this scene isn't too bad, I, I don't really need to see the arc. It's just, oh, there's, there's the arc, cool boy. There it is. <sighs> Raiders was a damn good movie, wasn't it? It was better than this one. I also like this first fight scene with the Russian. They have a little scuffle and then they fall onto this rocket that blasts off and their faces get kind of pushed back and Harrison stumbling around trying to find his hat. Even his hat didn't survive that rocket. And so that sequence is kind of entertaining. Uh, this opening is fine. But as the rocket blasts by, Spielberg doubled down on the gophers and gives them a little ooh -dee -dee moment. Because more gophers, I guess, is what we really came here for. The following scene is easily the most talked about scene of Indiana Jones history, perhaps more talked about than any of the, the controversy surrounding the violence of Temple of Doom. The nuke the fridge moment. Of course, let's talk about this thing. So this is not the first time Indy has survived something crazy, but it's certainly the most insane and stupid thing I've ever seen in an Indiana Jones movie. The creepiness of the setup works for me. Indy's in this town and there's all these mannequins everywhere, the television's on, he has no idea what the fuck is going on, but there's this alarm going off. I like the setup. And as the nuke drops, he gets in a lead-lined fridge that blasts through the air and lands really fucking hard on the ground multiple times. I mean, forget the nuclear bomb. The fucking fridge lands like that like eight times. He's a pancake in there. His guts should be all over that. But whatever, it's the beginning of the movie. God damn. What a dumb scene. And Spielberg tripled down on the fucking gopher. And we got him one more time. Thanks for the gopher. I needed that. I'll say this about Crystal Skull. We are warned pretty early. The opening shot and this whole scene ending with the fridge. It's a giant fucking red flag. Next, Indy is interviewed by the FBI and they seem very interested in him because he was just seen with these Russians since the 50s. So that's not good. This is one of the scenes that has a lot of ADR going in and out. Here's a few examples. Oh. You mean that Air Force fiasco in 47? I was tossed into a bus with blacked out windows and 20 people I wasn't allowed to speak to. Good to see you too, Bob. <laughs> Relax, boys. I can vouch for Dr. Jones. What the hell is going on, huh? KGB on American soil? Who is that woman? I remember the first time I saw this in 2008 being like, ew, it doesn't sound right. There's something, how does that happen? There's a lot of things in this movie that I don't understand how it happened. 
how it got into the final cut, but this is one of them. We find out that Marcus Brody, as well as Indy's father, have passed away. They tried to get Sean Connery to come back for this movie for a little bit, and he just didn't want to do it. So, he's dead. <laughs> In the movie, he's dead. God damn it. And here's where we meet Shia LaBeouf, who plays Mutt Williams in the film. A lot has been said about Shia LaBeouf. He has said a lot about this movie. He said a little bit too much about this movie and kind of fucked up his career for a while because he did not make Harrison Ford or Spielberg very happy with his comments about the film. And despite the fact that his character in this movie kind of sucks, he's definitely given the role his all. It's just that the character, I don't need it. It's just a thing. Which brings me to something that I really want to talk about. It's that Indy 4 has a lot of good ideas. It's just that they don't really coalesce into anything. Because whenever I watch a film like this made by somebody like Spielberg, I have to ask myself, how did somebody with his instincts think that some of these choices were good ideas? How did he think that this was worth everyone's time? The people who made it and the people who watched it in his time. And I think just on paper... There are a lot of good ideas here. For instance, Mutt telling Indy that he just wants to work on motorcycles for the rest of his life. And Indy's like, you want to do that for the rest of your life? And he's like, yeah, you got a problem with that? He's like, no, not if that's what you love and don't let anyone else tell you different. He says it's okay that Mutt quit school. But later in the film, when he finds out that Mutt is actually his son, he's like, you're going to go back and finish school. There's a lot of good ideas in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. But that's also the problem. Indiana Jones films should be filled with exceptional ideas, not just acceptable ideas. And you can have a script that has tons of great moments, but sometimes they just don't coalesce into anything. And if your film is just a collection of moments that could be a fun clip to watch on YouTube, but you don't really want to watch the whole movie because nothing really comes together, that's what Indiana Jones 4 feels like for me. So let's get back to the film. This restaurant scene is not too bad. It's an exposition scene. We got to learn about the Crystal Skull and John Hurt's character, Oxley, that's apparently lost his mind. Mutt is wondering where his mother is. He calls her Mary. And although there's no monkey brains or snakes or eyeballs in soup, the exposition is handled fairly well. And I like how the scene plays up that 1950s thing of jocks versus greasers. There's a fun little fight, which leads to maybe the best action scene in the film, a motorcycle chase through the city, where Indy crawls through a car, gets back onto the motorcycle. There's a lot of great stunts in this scene, although there's one aspect of it that's always bothered me. It's the fact that they decapitate the statue of Marcus Brody, and it's sort of played as a joke. Not only has the character of Marcus Brody passed away in the canon, Denholm Elliott, the actor, has also passed away. And I find it strange and a little disrespectful. Something else I have to talk about is all the, hey, you're old jokes. There's a lot of them. They don't bother me. It's something I think that the filmmakers are acknowledging. Hey, we're not vain about this. Harrison Ford's not vain about this. Yeah, I'm old. But there's one joke in particular where Shia LaBeouf is like, what are you, like 80? And you know, if they make Indiana Jones 5 like they're planning, he might actually be 80. More power to you, man. Fuck it. Punch people all you want in movies for the rest of your life, Harrison Ford. I love watching you do it. There's also an aspect of this film that feels really underdeveloped to me. It's the relationship between Mutt and Oxley. Because when they find a cell where Oxley was kept for a while, and there's all these words and drawings everywhere, Mutt gets really emotional about it because he feels like his friend lost his mind. I don't really understand that much about the relationship. It's all just kind of blurted out really quick in the restaurant scene. It's kind of like Marty and Doc Brown in the Back to the Future movies. How do they fucking know each other? Where? Who knows? The, where, where, how do they know each other? He's young. He's old. What's happening? And this mystery that's being uncovered about this Crystal Skull and Akator and all of these places that Oxley has apparently been to and now is leading them on a journey in a sense feels very undercooked. It's not that it's boring. It's just uninvesting. It's just like, oh, they did a thing. They, they went to a place. There's a drawing on the wall. And now they're going to go in another place. And there might be another drawing on the wall there. Yay! It feels more like a Tomb Raider movie. 
And although I like Tomb Raider, I've always viewed it as Indiana Jones light. But this is actually an Indiana Jones movie, and it's not supposed to feel that way. So here we get to a grave robbing scene with a lot of great sets, and a line reading that is so horrendous. And it's baffling to me that it's in the movie, because it's way better in the trailer. You're a teacher? Part time. You're a... A teacher? Part time. You're a teacher? Part time. So like I said, the sets during this scene are very impressive. Although it's just kind of funny that he's carrying around this fucking plastic looking skull and he's just like talking while he kind of balances it in his hands and it just it looks like he got it at Walmart. But Mac returns and the Russians capture Indy and Mutt. We meet John Hurt as Oxley. He's completely lost his mind and the Russians try to use the skull and its apparent psychic abilities on Indiana Jones. Here we learn Spalco's plan, which is basically to harness these psychic abilities, to put their thoughts and their desires into the minds of other people, like as a form of warfare, basically. They don't even have to lift a finger. And while this scene isn't bad it's just it's like what is what does this have to do with anything but the real development of this scene is when we see karen allen as marion ravenwood once again a welcome sight she's pretty good in the movie i like i like her I, i've always liked marion and she's not bad it's just that her care she's just there you know she drives the car <laughs> The problem here isn't the pieces they have assembled in this film, it's what they've chosen to do with them. Although I do like Indy's adorable reaction to seeing Marion again. <laughs> when they get a chance to escape, they encounter quicksand, or as Indy calls it, a dry sand pit. And you get a little callback to Indy's fear of snakes when Mutt throws the snake towards him instead of a rope, and he's gotta grab hold of it to be pulled out of the sand pit. I like how Indy can't touch it unless they refer to it as a rope. They have to stop saying snake and say rope for him to be able to touch it. It's sort of something that the MCU does a lot. Sometimes you watch an MCU movie and it's fairly entertaining. There's a lot of good scenes. But the story, the narrative, is so disposable and throwaway that you forget about it within a day or two. And that's how I feel about this movie. You know, there's lots of scenes that are entertaining enough. It's just that the bad ideas are bad ideas, like really standout bad ideas. There's still some, in fact, the worst ones yet to come that we'll talk about in this movie. Here's where we start the jungle chase. Every one of these movies has a chase scene and I remember being so excited to see what Spielberg was going to do with this jungle chase. There's a joke in the beginning of it though that I never really understood. Mutt throws Indy his knife and Indy opens it and you hear fabric tear. Mutt reacts as if something has happened but Indy just gets up and starts untying their ropes. So either he ripped his leather jacket or stabbed himself. It's one of those two options, and I, I don't really see either of them paying off in this moment. It feels like a joke that was set up, but there's no punchline. We've already talked about vulnerability a little bit for Indiana Jones, but this sequence is one of the biggest examples of the lack of it in this movie. He basically drives throughout the whole scene. He leaps onto a car filled with Russians, punches them all real good, punches Mac, and then drives. He does nothing in this scene. It was such a disappointment. The majority of the scene is focused around Mutt. He has a sword fight with Spalco. Everything in this sequence somehow looks CG and green screen, even though the large majority of it was actually shot on location. It looks really fucking fake. During this scene, we get the next horrific offense that Kingdom of the Crystal Skull gave us, and that was Tarzan. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, but he swings around on vines like a fucking Tarzan guy. What were they doing? What is, why? How did this, be? Who, whose idea was that? The guy who had the idea had to then go to someone else and say, I have an idea. <laughs> and then that guy had to go, hey, yeah, I like that. They had to shoot it. They had to set it up. They had to prepare for it. They had to edit it. And they had to fucking put it in the movie. A lot of people had this idea. I don't know why they had the idea. <laughs> Honestly, this is something that terrifies me. 
because we all know how great of a filmmaker Spielberg is, the instincts that George Lucas has for story, and they still had these ideas, and they were like, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. This is good. It's a terrifying notion that to have as great of instincts as they do normally have, they can still do something like this. It's also kind of cathartic in a way. It's like, you know what? You can fail as an artist. You don't have to be perfect because even Spielberg can have Tarzan Mutt, Indiana Jones' son movie with the nuclear bomb fridge and gophers. But once again, why is everything so goddamn bright? It's like they have no shadow. There's no dark levels in this movie. Everything is just so fucking bright and fake looking. And for a movie that was shot on film and largely shot on location, it's baffling to me. All I can think of is that Spielberg's cinematographer was trying to emulate the stuff that Douglas Slocum did instead of just doing what he knows how to do. And, and they try to make it look like the older movies, but it doesn't. It, it looks like this weird digital thing. Even though Spielberg is like, no, 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 film, 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 film. And for some fucking reason, this is the most digital, clean, glossy looking Indiana Jones movie I've ever fucking seen. How does a movie from 2008 look worse than the movies from the 80s? As far as John Williams goes, he's never going to compose a bad score. But this is easily his worst score for Indiana Jones. I do love Mutt's theme, though. It's excellent. That is a great theme. And I also like... The Crystal Skulls theme. It's very, very suspenseful. Feels very B-movie, as it should. But again, with vulnerability, how in the fuck did they survive this? In fact, there's a similar moment at the beginning of the jungle chase. But after the chase ends, Spielberg introduces his creepy crawly of choice for this movie, Fire Ants, which came from an earlier draft. And they're pretty cool. I like the fight with the Russian. It's pretty bare-knuckled, but it's also pretty 50-50. They're just kind of punching each other a lot. You never really feel like Indy's getting his ass handed to him, or as I said, escaping in the skin of his teeth. He gets knocked down a few times, but he basically knocks the shit out of the guy, and then the ants crawl into his mouth, and easily the creepiest, scariest shot in the movie. It's a very tame movie. There's something I noticed while watching it. Indiana Jones never fires his gun. It's the only movie where he never fires his gun. I mean, come on, man. Marion drives their truck onto a tree branch that then falls into a river and it acts as like a fly swatter <laughs> towards the Russians on the cliff. I, uh... You're losing me here, Spielberg. It's at this point that the film becomes a series of sets. One collapses as sand pours out of it. They have to run down retracting steps. There's a room filled with a lot of loot and the crystal skull has to be put on top of it. There's just no tension or stakes to this finale. It's nothing like opening the Ark of the Covenant or battling Mola Ram on a collapsing bridge or the tests at the end of Last Crusade where he's trying to save his father's life. They're just going from tomb to tomb to tomb. And eventually they come across a bunch of alien skulls. The skull leaps from their hands back onto the alien skeleton. And it says that it wants to give them a gift. They don't want to have anything to do with this gift though. Because a portal opens above them. A pathway to another dimension. Apparently they're interdimensional beings. And Spalco, having followed them there, led by Mac. Who once again changes his loyalties as he does throughout this entire movie jumps in front and says, I want to know everything. Give me all the knowledge in the world. And the CGI alien glares at her and the overload of knowledge, like, blows her up. <sighs> Look, I know that all the Indiana Jones bad guys always go out because of their own greed, because of their pursuit of the item, but the idea of, like, knowledge overload blows you up. <laughs> Mac dies when he's sucked into the portal and our heroes are trapped in rising water and they're blown out of this thing. And a giant UFO lifts from the ground and then vanishes into thin air. A lot of people did not like this ending, myself included. And it's not just because aliens. I don't really care that Indiana Jones encountered aliens. There's tons of Indiana Jones books where he encounters weirder things than that. It's just the fact that I don't give a shit about anything that's happening. As I said already, there's no tension here. 
I don't feel invested at all. Everything just happened in a series of really boring sequences. It didn't feel like it led to anything of interest or merit, and the emotional impact that took place in Last Crusade between Indy and his father is nowhere to be seen between Indy and his son. And look at Indy's jacket. Look how clean it is. He just got launched out of a geyser. This film looks so fresh and polished and just, it, there's nothing about it that feels like an Indiana Jones movie, except Indiana Jones happens to be in it. We cut to a wedding scene and Marion and Indy are getting married, which is nice that Indy and Marion are settling down. And I'll never forget in 2008, even though I was in denial about how I felt about the movie, Shia LaBeouf as Mutt picking up that hat terrified me. I was like, don't put that fucking hat on, man. Oh, thank God. Okay. Whew. That was Spielberg kind of rescuing that moment for me because I was terrified of the notion of them saying, now we're going to do Mutt Williams, the movie. <laughs> Please don't do that. Indiana Jones is Indiana Jones. Don't ever take that hat away from him. Whew, that was a close one. So as I've said, Crystal Skull is a movie that is filled with some ideas that work and there are scenes that are fun to watch. It's not a terrible trash movie in every way. It's just a film that has good ideas that really don't add up to anything. And it's third act just goes completely downhill. And you begin to realize that the sequences that were fun were just that exactly. Just these little moments, these little lightning in a bottle moments that added to nothing. It's one of the most disappointing movies I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm gonna give Kingdom of the Crystal Skull a C minus. Guys, thank you so much for watching my Indiana Jones reviews. I've always wanted to do more in-depth reviews of these films. The other three are on my channel right now. I hope you check them out. I hope you enjoy them. Guys, thank you so much as always for watching. And if they make Indiana Jones 5, let's hope it's good. You guys are the best. Thank you as always. And if you like this, you can click right here and get stuckmanized.